The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Melissa Lapsa from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and we're really excited today to be bringing you a Tech Solution Team webinar on building envelope commissioning and retro commissioning. And we have a lot of material here to get through today, so I'll go ahead and get started. So next slide, please. So uh, what is the Building Envelope Tech Team? Um, a lot of you on the line are familiar and members of the tech team, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but just as a high level, um, what we're trying to do is provide uh, information uh, and resources to help advance uh, energy efficient building envelope tech uh, solutions. And that's through the form of technology verification studies, specification documents, case studies and fact sheets, calculators, and analytical tools. Um, and we want to hear from all of you to see, you know, help us prioritize what we are providing so that energy efficient envelope solutions um, can be more available in the marketplace. So the members of our tech team are myself, Dr. Simon Palin, Dr. Mahavir Banderi, and Caroline Hazard. Next slide, please. And um, what we're doing is engaging and supporting our members in efforts to accelerate adoption of energy efficient building envelope technologies. We're building awareness with guidance and information, conducting verification studies, and other technical assistance as needed. Next slide, please. We're very excited that we just launched our tech team in November, and so we've had two tech team meetings, and we also presented two successful sessions at the Better Building Summit last, week, last month in D.C., and so our current list of members uh, are listed here. We also will provide this uh, PowerPoint file and the recording, a link to the recording to all of you participating today. Uh, and this has a link to these organizations for more information. And the members include building owners, managers, property managers, any &E firms, and construction uh, industry and installers. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to our Better Building Alliance Tech Solution team members, we have friends. And these organizations include researchers, academics, trade associations, energy service providers, manufacturers, and subject matter experts. And this list is growing as well. So I'd encourage you, if you're not already on our list and would like to get involved with our Envelope Tech Solution team, to just drop me an email, which I'll provide at the end of this webinar, um, and we will get you added right away. Next slide, please. So the agenda for our webinar today, and um, we're going to have two great speakers, and then we're going to open it up for so, some great Q&A. Uh, but Dr. Simon Palin is first going to talk about why building enclosure commissioning. And as I mentioned, he's in our on our tech uh, team, lead team, and he is at Oak Ridge National Lab, but he has been worked in the buildings industry since 2006, and he spent several years conducting research in Europe. He joined our Building Envelope Systems Research Team in 2013 at ORNL, and he serves as a risk assessment moisture simulation expert and works with both existing simulation tools and creates new tools to estimate the hydrothermal, which is heat and moisture performance of building elements such as walls and roofs. And following Simon, uh, Dr. Paul Totten is going to speak, and he is going to speak on going deeper, building enclosure commissioning and retro commissioning. And Paul is a vice president at WSP and leads the building enclosures division. He has over 20 years of experience in the field of structural engineering, building enclosure technology and commissioning, and building science. He has concentrated his expertise on the evaluation of an analysis of heat, air, and moisture transfer and the cumulative effect of these elements on building components and building operation. He is past co-chair of the Washington, D.C. AIA NIBS Building and Closure Council, a member of NIBS, ASHRAE, and U.S. Green Building Council, and was a committee member of the NIBS Guideline 3, Exterior Enclosure Technical Requirements for the Commissioning Process. So following these two uh, presentations, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to have the Q&A. We're going to talk about uh, next steps on this topic, and then uh, we will wrap up and adjourn. So with that, I will turn it the next slide over to Dr. Palin. Yes, thank you, Melissa. Okay, yeah, I'm going to give a short introduction to, um, to Paul. Um, I'm just briefly going to talk about why commissioning, why sh should we do it. Um, 
about the importance of looking at the building as a as a having a holistic view when and an holistic building envelope assessment uh, why that is important and um, we should talk about installation quality uh, making sure that it's being uh, buildings are built as designed and when um, relating to uh, cost and investment and return of investment we obviously want to uh, make sure that we get what we pay for and um, uh, looking at optimized energy performance is another aspect uh, benefit of doing commissioning um, maybe um, they're interested in having some building certification such as a lead and commissioning is is important or um, user comfort is uh, uh, is one of the reasons why um, conducting commissioning so uh, next slide please okay so I mean, building envelope is complicated. Uh, most of us know that. And there are different control layers in the building envelope, and they have served one or two or several purposes. Um, we have like a water resistive barrier that's supposed to um, 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 give protection for, for precipitation, rain, and such. And we have an air barrier that um, should help to reduce, if not minimize, you know, minimizing uh, the air leakage through our buildings. Obviously, we have uh, we need a control layer that does has the uh, thermal resistance properties, insulation that is. Uh, we might need a vapor barrier. We might need something for light, for noise, and and as part of this, though, is also structural performance, of course. Uh, next slide, please. The thing is that uh, we need we can look at the whole building as a. As a pieces of puzzles that needs to be put together. We might have very good components individually that, that works great, uh, but we need to make sure that these components works great together as well. And that's why it's so important to have this view, a uh, holistic view when uh, looking, doing a building envelope assessment or commissioning. Um, next slide, please. So I'm just giving you, I'm just, uh, give uh, giving you a, an example here uh, where we we might look at we have an existing building and uh, if you have a brick facade and we might have interest in keeping the brick and, and looking at okay what uh, options do we got to improve the energy resistance um, the thermal resistance of the wall and then okay maybe we need to do something from the inside but what can then and, and then typically then a commissioning agent would would Think that okay, what 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 could what could be the impact and and or part of that wall and and one one concern could be that okay, if I put insulation on the inside in a cold climate, that means that the facade material might be colder by doing this. So it would be of interest maybe and certainly for brick then to see uh, will the number of freeze thaw cycles increase. Uh, by such uh, a retrofit measure and next slide please so and what then can be done is that you okay you can uh, create a simulation model for this example here it's in Chicago we pick the climate next slide please and then uh, one can study and look at the temperature at the brick and see okay did something happen with this and uh, the blue is just representing the, the temperature variation of the brick um, before the retrofit. And it's touching the freezing point a couple of times. But when we look at the red curve, which is after the retrofit, we see that it's const uh, frequently going up and down across that freezing point, meaning that now, oh, we increased the number of freezing cycles by with more than 100 now. and, and one, then our, the question would be, OK, is this brick able to handle this, or do we need to look at a different uh, retrofit approach? Next slide, please. And we want to make sure that, uh, that we have a good installation quality. We want it to be built as it's designed to be built. Um, next slide. So as an example, and just to showing you the the importance of this and maybe one of you have, or some of you have seen this slide before but 
This is really important. We had a study where we looked at the air tightness of 12 identical buildings, and we, we, we measured the air tightness of these buildings. And, and one, if, if we look at the air tightness, what might influence the air tightness in a building could be the construction design, it could be the flow area, the volume, number of penetration, types of penetration and installation, what the material properties are, and workmanship. But what is interesting with this is that we looked at 12 identical buildings. So uh, can I have another click, please? Uh, all the, the, these will be eliminated, all of them, except for workmanship. So that the installation quality is what is left. And that, that then we can look at the result and understand the importance of uh, installation quality. Uh, next slide, please. Here we present the, the tested uh, air tightness from this study, uh, where we see a great variation. ACH, ACH75 means the number of times uh, the air inside uh, the building is exchanged with the outdoor air at a pressure gradient of 75 Pascal. It's, it's just a relative indicator, but it helps to compare between buildings, one building uh, with another, and so on. Uh, and, and we see that we have almost down to four, and it stretches up to 10. So uh, it's, it's more than a factor of two in, in performance, and this is only uh, because of uh, variation in installation quality. Next slide. And quickly as well, I mean, uh, money, of course. Uh, um, we, when we have our energy bill, we have our energy charges, and we also have to pay for demand charge. Uh, and next slide, please. And here's just a, an example where we have two customers. They both Pursue, uh, produce the, or uh, use the same amount of energy, uh, but they have a totally different uh, cost just because customer A has a much higher demand than customer B. And it would be, this would be a sort of exemplify the, the importance of, again, installation quality, and, 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 but also that the importance of uh, showing the importance of the retrofit and uh, the return of the, of the investment. Uh, next slide. With that, a brief introduction. I'm going to head, uh, give, uh, present next speaker for today. So, Paul, thanks for presenting to us to get, uh, today. No problem. So, uh, we can go to the next slide. So I'm going to cover the Building and Closure Commissioning process as it's currently defined under LEED version 4 and talk a little bit about older buildings and retro commissioning of buildings, how we can repeat that process over and over again on our building infrastructure. Next slide. Just a brief uh, outline of the presentation. I'm going to kind of discuss the process as it's defined uh, leading from ASHRAE Guideline 0 all the way through to the ASTM standard we're currently uh, using across the industry talk a little bit about how that applies and gets broken down differently for retro commissioning and give a few project examples. And uh, as noted earlier, we'll take questions at the end. Next slide. So we have a wide range of buildings that we can um, commission, everything from significant museums to stadiums to schools. Um, some of these are existing infrastructure that we're tying into. So the school example up in the right-hand corner is an existing brick masonry building with some historic aspects that was receiving a new arm to the building, including solar chimneys for passive ventilation. Next slide. And we can also look at other types of tie-ins to uh, much more historic, historically significant buildings, um, and even everything from, from upgrading HVAC within these spaces to what that impact may be on the enclosure systems. We can have programs broken down to something as simple as plaster repair and define a commissioning program simply for the plaster repair program or retrofitting, uh, installing new windows into an existing uh, facade, and how we deal with the flashings and the membranes for that flashing system. Next slide. So what is commissioning? I think there's a couple terms that you will see throughout the, the slides, and one of them is listed here. I'll list both of them now. Um, we have to focus on the owner's project requirements. What is an owner expecting out of the project that they're planning to build and construct, or renovate or revitalize if it's an existing building? 
And what is the basis of design? What does the design team feel they need to do to accomplish the owner's project requirements? And so what you'll see over and over again in the, in the context of commissioning is um, the OPR, the owner's project requirements, and the basis of design. The process overall is quality focused. Um, I would describe a good commissioning authority as a conscience of the project. They're there to verify that not only is design intent being met, but to point out issues that may um, result, result in an issue for the owner long term. Widespread condensation risk, uh, water infiltration risk. Next slide. We have a couple different processes that have been worked on throughout the industry, starting with the commissioning process as defined by ASHRAE in uh, guideline zero. Uh, that was built upon for enclosure commissioning. I was part of the initial and follow-up effort by NIPS for guideline three. Next slide. And that is now uh, turned into a, an ASTM standard. So um, similar to the MEP side, which is going to see an ANSI joint at ANSI ASHRAE standard in the upcoming years, we now have an ASTM standard that defines the process for commissioning. It talks a little bit about qualifications. Um, you do need a a group of commi uh, people commissioning your enclosure will understand roofing, waterproofing, air barrier, wall systems, insulation systems, and the building physics of those systems. It's based on NIPS guideline three as a backdrop and includes two levels of commissioning, uh, basic and enhanced. These same two levels have fed into uh, LEED version four and other commissioning standards and guides that we're seeing roll out across the country from different entities of something that's a much lighter, maybe cost for an owner, just to have a single design review to make sure that the basis of design aligns with their owner project requirements. And that's something that's more enhanced. Additional design reviews, shop drawing review, submittal review, construction observation, observation of performance testing at a mock-up at maybe at a laboratory or in the field, and some follow-up measurement and verification. So it gives you these two scales of program. Next slide. So where's the value? If you want to just click on that a few times, we have a little animation on this slide. Probably just three, this should be good. So as the project becomes more complex, there is actually more value in doing commissioning. Um, and, there, and the reason for that is on the most basic of buildings, there's quite a bit of cost that has to go into a commissioning program. It still has some value for that owner. It may be on a brick masonry restoration job. There's still some value in doing it. The program might need to be defined uh, to be more cost effective while still providing that value. But as we get into complexity, and the complexity could be as simple as we're doing a new glass curtain wall. We're tying it into portions of an existing uh, stone masonry building. That interface actually has a lot of complexity to keep the, the new from condensing, to separate zones of pressurization between HVAC. And there is, is, is a good spot to have additional oversight of your project to help reduce the risk overall with that project. And then uh, to provide better value for the owner at the end, that they have some confidence that our systems are going to perform together. They're going to work better, and we're going to have some reduced risk of water infiltration, heat loss and gain, air infiltration, exfiltration across those interface conditions. Next slide. It can be broken up into these steps. So we have a pre-design phase. This may be uh, uh, starting with an owner project requirement charrette and then working through an OPR BOD review. We have our design phase, schematic design, design development, and construction documents, so the various phases of the design team creating the, the drawings and specifications for the project. We then move into a construction phase where we'll see submittals and shop drawings, the intent for the contractor to build the project. And then we move into kind of a close out and occupancy phase, troubleshooting over that first two, one or two years to address issues that may arise. Next slide. This can then be broken up into the portions of the actual commissioning process. So we have these steps that were defined on the previous slide. And so in the pre-design, as I previously uh, noted, this is where our, our OPR and BOD will be reviewed and compared. And the commissioning uh, agent and authorities uh, role is to point out discrepancies. The owner wants a 12-story building, designers designing a 16-story building. Those two things don't match. Did we change our mind on the size of the building? Is the square footage the same? And this is the new route. We need to have those documents aligned. Um, our design reviews are typically two stages for commissioning. Design development, we need enough details and um, information in the set to really define what the design team wants to do for the roofs, the walls, the air barriers, the flashings. And usually it's schematic design. That stuff is very, very much light. It may have a general system defined, but not really the specifics. And then construction documents. Before we go to construction, validating that all the uh, changes that were looked for in DD have been incorporated. 
We have our construction phase. We have our closeout. And many of our enclosure commissioning projects, we find that the closeout doesn't always have post-occupancy work. Yeah, that's becoming a more and more common thing to start seeing that. But usually an owner uh, would like a closeout document, something that summarizes all of the work that was done from the beginning of the job to the end. And we tend to provide that electronic format, a summary of all the documentation. Next slide. So what does this process look like? Um, it could be something as simple as infrared thermography. So if I'm doing the existing building, one step that may, um, in, in many cases, has to happen before we dig too deep into the process is to do an upfront condition assessment of the infrastructure of that building. What, what does the roof look like? What do the walls look like? What is the existing thermal performance of the systems? And one way we might evaluate that is thermography. On the uh, picture right below that is performance testing of some historic windows on a project that we did here in the Washington, D.C. market. Do the existing building, uh, the building components leak? How do those need to be repaired? And then we'll drag all the way through doing construction observation, design concepts, and in some cases observing of those design details. Next slide. Under lead, or, uh, under the uh, change to lead version 4, we have actually the basic and enhanced described uh, pretty intrinsically in the prerequisite. There's a couple things that owners and architects and, and those working with LEED need to understand. The commissioning authority now needs to be retained no later than design development, no later than DD. If they are retained after DD, they no longer meet the prerequisite. The enclosure commissioning agent usually would be retained at the same time. And they do need to do two things under the prerequisite for enclosures. We have to review the OPR and compare it to the basis of design, the BOD. And we have to do a single design review of construction documents. Next slide. Under enhanced commissioning, there's a few more requirements put in, but a general breakout of that. An additional design review is done earlier. So if you're going to do an enhanced program, you're doing a, a second design review that happens at the DD design development phase before the CD review that would happen under the prerequisite. You'd have construction phase services. And this is where there's some flexibility in how an owner defines their commissioning program. Uh, we've seen the most basic programs of um, just reviewing repair documents or submittals for restoration and then doing the on-site performance testing observation and site visits and that is the construction phase document. We see more extensive on some of our museum projects. We're going to a laboratory watching full-scale mock-ups. We're reviewing all of the shop drawings, all the structural calculations for the facade uh, components. We're doing an extensive number of construction site visits and reviewing all the field testing for the enclosure systems. So this is where an owner can really pick and choose where they spend some of their dollars and then our closeout is typically uh, final documentation, is what uh, is looked under the ASTM standard and lead, provide documentation to the owner of the, the process from the OPR BOD review through, through the final site visits. And uh, hopefully at that point, all the open items that were issues on the project have now been resolved, but it would also list any remaining items that the design or construction team need to resolve before turnover of that building. Next slide. Uh, within this, we have a series of uh, responsibilities. So the commissioning and closure commissioner, they would be part of the commissioning team led by an overall commissioning authority that may include an MEP commissioning agent, a lighting commissioning agent, fire and life safety commissioning agent, amongst others. Their contract, however, these jobs get bought out differently. We've contractually been tied to, based on the owner's requirements, the construction manager or general contractor on some projects, the design team on some projects, and then are picked up during the construction phase by the owner. So again, there's this careful balance of what an owner is requiring contractually. They may assign the commissioning agent or commissioning authorities to a certain party as well as their project requirements. We then have to interface with all the other professionals um, on the contracting side and on the design side throughout the process. And it allows us to, to not only comment, but we have to work with uh, the team to resolve issues that may come up within our, our purview of commissioning. Next slide. If we break this down to actually looking at the process, uh, we may have some project requirements that are pretty uh, defined by an owner. I want to reduce my energy consumption. I have no tolerance for water leaks. And so, uh, and when I look through the base of design, how is the designer resolved that? Have they gone to cold com uh, code compliant installation levels? R25 for a lot of the roofs in the United States. What type of waterproofing are they using on the roof and maybe the plazas? What type of flashings are they using? So we're looking for those really defined parameters in the base of design or some general understanding of the intent of the design team to make sure that those align with the project requirements an owner may have. Next slide. 
to look at all the elements that uh, lead into an owner's project requirements. It's everything from the initial vision of the project to how they may want to operate and maintain that, that facility. If it's an existing uh, facility, it may mean something that's going through upgrading or improvement, and then the maintenance cycles that are being defined for that. Um, there may be system performance requirements. They want a curtain wall that's going to withstand hurricane loading or blast, and those are built into the owner project requirements. Next slide. And so we also might see things on system integration, the level of redundancy they want in their details. Uh, some owners are very defined that they want two levels of redundancy at every roof-to-wall connection, every curtain wall or fenestration tie-in to the wall. Um, and sometimes we'll see that like on hospital projects where leakage at those locations has got no tolerance uh, for risk of mold growth and contamin contamination. They may have uh, training requirements for their own facility staff. We've seen this with roofing sometimes, where a campus may want one roofing type throughout all of their buildings because their, their staff is familiar with that roofing type. And then anything that's new with the system, they get their staff trained on as part of the closeout of the project. Next slide. As we get into the design reviews, we are comparing our drawing uh, reviews back to the owner project requirements on the base of design. Uh, when I'm doing a consulting or design project on behalf of an architect, uh, these comments might look a little bit different. I might say, here are your options for flashing. You should use this flashing as a consultant. As a commissioning authority, we may get some of the same context, but the comment may read instead, uh, the flashing detail that's provided does not provide long-term durability and is at risk for water infiltration. Here are four options we've seen used with great success on past projects for improving this condition. So although the designer is getting the same end information, it's the way it's delivered aligning it with the OPR that is very critical for a commissioning agent. We'll go through those design reviews. I know that only uh, DT and CD were listed earlier. Our firm tends to find that if we do an initial review at schematic design, we may find something that needs to be switched out earlier. So for example, we may have a design team that's chosen a roofing system that due to other some unforeseen condition, contaminants in the air or something near that site may not perform as well. So we catch that schematic design before they fully detail that system. There may be less design effort that's needed later on to go back and change that out. We'll typically want to compare systems so that um, if there are options that a designer should be considering, they, they understand the pros and cons of each. And then talk about material compatibility and the HVAC system, the, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems interaction with the enclosure. A lot of times we find that these, these reviews come in and we don't see that the team has really had a chance to communicate. And we've seen this as the consultant where we get a, a set of comments back and it's clear that they haven't looked at the HVAC layout, and so the comment might be, you don't, you're not getting heat to the window system. And if they looked at the HVAC layout, they would find there's diffusers for the, the heating system very close to almost every window on the project. So regardless of which role um, one's playing, they need to make sure that there's an understanding of those systems interacting because they can drive a lot of risk. Next slide. In the process of doing these design reviews, there has to be an intrinsic good understanding of the basic fundamentals of building physics and building science for walls and roofs and, and below grade waterproofing, uh, which direction heat transfer is going to occur at different times of the year, where the uh, various vapor flow control layers are. We may have a lower permeance material on the outside in certain climates like Florida, Washington, D.C., where we have higher humidity. We would do something different in, say, Kansas City or in Los Angeles or in Portland where the, where the climate conditions are different. We understand the airflow. And then how those impact our, our various systems, below grade waterproofing, our walls, our various types of cladding, our roofing and the interface between those assemblies. Next slide. And so something that might come out of this on say an existing building is something critical for like a window replacement program. We see these on all sorts of buildings on the commercial side, on the residential side, and on the looking at federal buildings. Window replacements are becoming more common. Um, if the building's in pretty good shape, this is a pretty good uh, target for energy improvement. We have a current project we're working on with mass masonry walls everywhere, and the, the walls have some efficiency. But the window replacement from single-pane glass, old steel windows to new windows has provided a 300% improvement of the window opening based on the overall percentage of the window influence on the rest of the building, 100% improvement of the energy performance of that building versus where it was performing today. So we find this as low-hanging fruit sometimes on projects. 
And one thing that we you may have to work through is flashing concepts. So with this designer, we provided a series of options where you can see in the top right photos, they end up having to fit around some existing portion of structure that would have been challenging to modify with this nice soldered flashing with a kind of indented end dam condition. Next slide. On our drawing markups, what you may see is something that um, is used by a number of the consultants and commissioning agents in the industry is color coding of the comments. So what you're seeing is a markup on this sheet. Everything's in blue. The blue identifies uh, concerns with the waterproofing of the detail and the tie-in below a door, which can be very challenging. Uh, we tend to follow red for thermal, green for air area considerations. Uh, for those of us who run the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, Fraunhofer Institute Wolfie program, hydrothermal analysis to look at heat and moisture movement through uh, through materials in one dimension. The green is a reminder to look at vapor permeates because the software uses the green color in the graphs to look at vapor drive. Next slide. We may be looking at something as simple as a roof davit. So we're finding more and more on retrofits and revitalizations and especially on new construction. More thought is being put into how we safely tie workers off on the roof, on the walls to do uh, window washing, to access the building for recocking and, and uh, repairs. And so what we'll find is that these details tend to have a massive thermal bridge potential. And sometimes they'll show condensation in certain climate zones below the davit. And the facility staff may assume they have a roof leak. And so we've had projects where somebody's ripped apart a perfectly good roof detail to find a condensation problem later. And so by insulating that, we, we find that you can box that out and make that airtight and reduce the risk. So these are comments that are helpful for a desire to, to pick a couple options. We've given them two different ways of isolating it in this detail. Next slide. When we get to something more complex, like a parapet tie-in, um, it's really important to have an understanding of how the different materials interface. Um, buildings move. We see a lot of movement, sometimes in a parapet condition, where we don't have the constraint anymore of the, the wall. If it's going to extend, it's going to extend upwards towards the, uh, the coping cap. And so the way that membrane is layered at those interfaces is actually pretty critical to make sure that when the building moves, it doesn't move that membrane and pull it apart, or it's going to create a leak. So although most, uh, many of the designers we see in the industry will draw their intent of a continuous membrane, we'll usually comment and recommend they show the layering of those membranes because of the criticalness of movement as part of their design intent. We find that almost every designer we've worked with, either as a consultant or a commissioning agent, has found this extremely helpful to think about. The other thing is we tend to insulate the front of the parapet wall, but lo and behold, we forget the back. In certain climate zones, that's a massive thermal bridge where we can drive massive condensation problems at the top of the building under stack effect. And so just understanding the limitations of the space, how much insulation we need based on the climate zone, then offering viable suggestions as a commissioning agent is extremely helpful to, for the design and owner team to make a decision on the cost and the benefit uh, versus the uh, extra effort that might need to go into it. Next slide. And then another thing that we find complex um, is sometimes we have an architectural intent. Maybe it's to meet a historic need. We have a lot of buildings where we're retrofitting roofing onto an existing uh, facade panel. It might be concrete. It may be stone. It may be pre old precast. Uh, many of our 50s and 60s buildings now are at the point where they can be uh, designated historic. So we're finding those modernist and brutalist structures are, are hitting that market. Many of them have historic skylines where you're seeing the sky at the top of the building, so you can't really put a coping all the way over for historic reasons. And so the detailing of something is, it seems as simple as two stages of sealant becomes very critical in these projects. And so we tend to work through with the, in our commissioning effort of thinking about how the water drains between those two joints and gets out of the building. Next slide. And the same is true at terrace conditions. We're looking at all these interfaces between now what is essentially almost two coping conditions, a parapet condition, a terrace, an area to, that either is being used for access. In this case, there's no railing shown, so this might just be a perimeter detail that's tied to something beyond with access. And then you have a second coping ahead of the curtain wall. So these transitions require some of the same redundancy in more than one location. But we're also tying a bunch of materials together, wall barriers, roofing system details, more wall barriers and back to roofing. And sometimes we occasionally end up with two different roofing systems. So helping the design team to see the nuances of how those go together are very critical. 
the way that the comments are put together to help them understand what would meet an owner's project requirements can be very helpful. Next slide. The other thing that we want to look at is uh, how the HVAC system interacts with our building enclosure. This is an atrium on a project that we're currently working on. It's a museum space. And our diffusers are kind of near the end of the, the top red to blue arrow. arrow. They're positioned because they can't aesthetically be any closer, pretty far from the glass. So we had a discussion with the team about how the air was going to move to the glass, the uh, effective convection, and the convection heat exchange of the occupants moving through the space. And we were able to resolve ways of heating parts of the structure to actually drive more heat into the glazing and use that as a, as a passive radiator to drive better convection in the space, which allowed us to look at downsizing the air handler for this atrium. Next slide. And then we've had another project where we looked at uh, issues driven by system furniture on a retro commissioning project where they were missing insulation in a couple zones of the building. And what was happening is in the summer, that solar radiation would immediately transfer to heat. And so people would have, the complaints would be, our feet are always hot. Or our legs feel extremely warm, but our upper body is cool because of the air conditioning. And so this thermal bridging issue, coupled with um, how the system furniture was laid out and how air moved around the system furniture. So if we look at the diffuser, we have air coming towards the glass. And then that's following the pathway outboard of the system furniture, people's desks and the partitions. And at the bottom of that, just for leveling purposes and sometimes to run like, uh, you know, infrastructure for IT, we tend to have a gap. It acts like almost like the same diffuser in the ceiling. In the winter, this problem was worse because of the thermal bridging. All that heat was being lost to the outside. And so the air would cool almost outdoor condition. So what people were experiencing above their desk was heat, and below their desk was the cold conditions of outside. So we went through a retrofit insulation in the SOFA condition, improved the system of furniture coordination to eliminate the issue. The HVAC in the space had already been optimized, and now is performing uh, the way it was expected. Next slide. We'll want to verify the submittals, and that's the shop drawings and the, the product submittals, and how that stuff aligns with the installation for schedule. Next slide. And then we want to go through mock-ups. And if we go to the next slide, it's probably a little bit easier to describe than looking at a visual. So if we go to a test lab, they're going to build a full-scale mock-up of part of your building, and they're going to run um, wind pressures using usually an air, airplane propeller create hurricane type loading. It's a very useful way of determining what details may or may not be working in the shop drawings before they actually build your building. And so in commissioning, this is a common thing that we're asked to do on more significant buildings. Next slide. And some of that testing can then be taken to the field. So what you're seeing on the right is that same type of lab testing, but using an interior chamber with a small leaf blower fan to essentially create a pressure like wind across the fenestration system. It's hard to tell, but we have a spray rack on the outside, and we're doing that in the field. So similar to the lab testing, the same types of tests can be performed in the field. What you're seeing on the uh, left-hand side uh, is this giant metal suction cup on a roof. This is a test run by FM Global to look at wind uplift uh, risk for that roof and its risk of debonding. It uses a deflectometer and this, this large suction cup material to essentially pull up the roof membrane uh, under some load to determine, is it going to be at risk for tear-off based on how much it deflects? Next slide. We also want to look at air, air leakage. Uh, if you're doing an Army Corps, Corps uh, building, they, do a, they have a pretty stringent air barrier set testing that they like to run. Well, then this whole building air, air barrier testing, which you fill the building with smoke. You essentially are running blower doors, and you're looking for visually the leaks. And then the second phase of that test is you can get a quantifiable amount of leakage. And sometimes in localized conditions on, on existing buildings, we may be asked to go and look at uh, what's going on with the enclosure. We seem to have a lot of air leakage or complaints of draftiness. And so we can go down and use that same type of testing very localized with a small handheld device to create smoke to determine if those interfaces are actually leaking air. Next slide. And then there's construction observation. And actually getting out on these projects, being able to walk the roof safely while being tied off and observing the materials as they go in. Next slide. And this is sometimes involves working with the trade. So what you can see on the right-hand side is one of our masonry projects where one of the details we like to use and, and comment on for our designers and our contractors is the small tab. You see these little squares around every brick tie that they're air sealing, and they're caulking only on three sides. The tie locations and like-age framing are very susceptible to air infiltration and some water risk. 
and over time that can corrode the little bit of uh, protection you have on a metal framing stud and make that tie loose over time. So this is a quick, easy way of doing that with redundancy. And sometimes, uh, you know, the contractor's stuck with some very tight conditions to put things in. And so as a commissioning agent, we are occasionally out in the field working with them to, to make sure that we have a good detail for that condition. And then going back to the design team and their consultant to discuss, here are some other things we're seeing in the field. What should we do? Do you have some ideas? So as a team, we can come together and find a better way of doing it. Next slide. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Great. Thanks, Paul. So, Simon, um, do you want to take it from here? Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I hope that some of you uh, have uh, some questions. If, this is Caroline. If folks want to raise their hand, if they have a question, we'll unmute your line, or you can chat into your chat window if you have questions. I'm not seeing any questions just yet. Maybe while we're waiting for some of those questions to come in, um, Simon, you could queue up some of the ideas that we're thinking about for the tech team to work on. Some of the questions well, we're asking ourselves that the members might help us think about in terms of resources that could be helpful to them. Right. Um, yeah, so let's click on next slide. And um, right. So I uh, we uh, set a couple of topics here that is relevant to for commissioning and uh, like to hear what what you think in your experience. Uh, for one of them, it's we we, uh, we want to talk a little bit about lead certification. Um, what is your experience here? Have you completed a project uh, um, uh, under with uh, um, under lead certification? And uh, what 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 was your experience from that? Um, um, I think Joan. Joan from Arlington might be unmuted. Joan, are you there? I'm here. Great. Maybe you can speak up just a little bit. You're a little far away, but okay. um, did you have some questions or thoughts to share? Um, well, I, I wanted to thank Paul. Um, we've met once before. He gave a great presentation to Arlington, and um, he is a phenomenal commissioning agent. Um, so thank you for all of that. Um, one question I had, uh, not necessarily related to the lead, but just overall, um, it's buildings are becoming more and more complicated. The, the photos you were showing and the, the um, designs you were showing and the commissioning review that has to happen. Um, is there any movement to make buildings a little bit more simple so that some of these, um, all these penetrations and different angles and fenestration connections and all of that um, might become simpler in the future instead of more and more complex? Seems like that would help the commissioning process as well as the um, just general construction process. So I'll take that question. This is Paul. Um, I don't see designers becoming more simple. In fact, Revit has really allowed designers to really stretch their imagination with architecture. However, as either an enclosure consultant or an enclosure commissioning agent, you can work to simplify the locations and the way that the detailing is done. So one of the buildings that you saw earlier is actually the International Spy Museum here in D.C., which will have a very complicated facade, but our air barrier installer on that project has complimented us on how simple the details are for them to install. We essentially made a box for all of their t detailing for the air barrier systems and the waterproofing that the facade is proud of. And in doing that, we've gone back to the basics. And so it is really the, the role of the consultants um, and the designers to find those simplifications within their design and for a commissioning agent on the enclosure side to work with them to help them resolve those, those simplifications. Uh, we dropped a lot of money out of that project for the owner by doing that, and so it, it, it is a thought process. Um, there's no hard, fast rule that your facade needs to be tied directly to all of your other performance layers. Uh, you can layer up a building differently, and so we have, when we work with designers, getting them, we're getting them thinking about that. 
where does this product actually need to go for error tightness? Can it be in a different plane where it's easier to detail? And then this other stuff can be out in front of it without compromising the overall building performance. Another thing I noticed is in your um, one of your slides, you said one of the um, owner project requirements was that there would there was no tolerance for water leaks. Why would that be different? Why wouldn't that just be an assumption in every project? By code, it is. Um, we like starting with the simple. So if I can get an owner to answer some simple questions, many times they, the the owners we work with don't always have a, a defined set of requirements. Like if I'm working with a major museum or hospital group, they usually have a very, very strict set of requirements for their designs. But not every owner does, and so we find that that's an easy one to get people to think about. The building should be watertight. And then we ask, what else should it be? Well, it should be airtight. Okay, then we need to think about ventilation. It ends up being a good discussion point. Um, the sad reality is, um, those in, in our, my field, we also spend a lot of our time on leaky buildings. And roof leakage is still one of the number one lawsuits experienced on uh, building construction. And so um, bolstering that and by putting in the project requirements as a reminder and being able to take that through as a commissioning agent through the project helps to minimize that risk greatly. And we have seen, um, I've seen in my past experience looking at some projects and talking to some of the other people in our industry that sometimes when an owner hasn't come out and said that emphatically, um, it's amazing how often it doesn't get achieved. But yes, it should be blatant. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, it should be blatant. Um, perhaps I just you just said that roof leaks are one of the most common problems, and I, I mean we see that also here. Um, but I'm wondering if that's something that um, one of the research labs is either looking at or should look at as ways to um, minimize those roof leaks, since it is a huge problem and costs a ton of money once one of those roofs does leak. Simon, do you want to take that one? Simon, is that? Yeah, Simon. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, can you please repeat that, John? Sure. The question um, about the roof leaks. Yeah. Um, Paul just mentioned that that's a uh, roof leaks are very common and they're very expensive and a, a big source of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. And it, it seemed that if we could um, nip that in the bud, design them better initially, perhaps have different materials, something like that. That's a um, problem that might be addressed by some of the building experts at one of the research labs. Right, yeah, so but but you're referring to water leaks now, right? Water leaks mostly. I mean, I think that's yeah. what the roof problem is, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, well, we, we see we see many problems, not just from the water leaks, but from air leaks actually through roofs as well that's supposed to be tight. And um, the problem with, um, um, the problem is, I mean, it's complex. We know that and it's uh, it's um, one roof that works in a cold climate not that will not necessarily work in a in a hot humid climate. And mm -hmm. um, there's uh, continuous research going on to uh, in, in the best of the world we would would have one solution that would work in any climate, but we're definitely not there yet. Mm -hmm. um, Simon. So I mean, maybe you could speak to some of the tools that are in our um, roofing web page section that could be helpful to folks um, in trying to think about addressing any problems or finding problems and then finding the products to yeah, solve sure. those roofing uh, problems. I, I, I um, understand we, we're short of time here a bit. Well, I'm just briefly saying that if uh, you all visit uh, um, our, our website, we have under Better Building Alliance, uh, we have one uh, category just for roofs, and and um, and uh, you can find some really useful information and resources there. Um, also, tools, um, especially for uh, we have one uh, newly launched air leakage calculator um, uh, for roofs, uh, which is very useful. Um, so I would definitely recommend uh, having a look at the the website for that. Um, I want to ask, um, just quickly go through a couple of these points that we've, um, bullets that we wanted to discuss here. Um, can I uh, have some clicks here so we can present the full list, basically? Uh, one more. There you go. 
Okay. So uh, what we wanted to talk about and what we think what we think is in, uh, of, of relevant and uh, of interest uh, for building envelope commissioning and hopefully for, for this for the team as well is when we talk about metrics in building envelope and or the building envelope performance or do I want to know I, w I want I want us to discuss if if they are useful do we think that they they represent the performance of building uh, are they too many are they complicated do, are we missing metrics or I we really, really would appreciate some some of your th thoughts and experience there uh, also when it comes to buildings built as designed um, what is your experience here um, have you seen um, when when it's not perfectly built, have, have there been what's the reason for that? Is a lack of communications, and if so, what action do you think uh, are needed? Um, uh, is I, like Joanne said here, is the envelope systems too complicated? Um, and should, do are we looking for more bulletproof systems? Um, is it because? The reason why it's not building it built as design is that because there's conflicts between trades and uh, and things like that. And we, I also wanted to, uh, we also wanted to maybe discuss the costs associated. Um, based on these um, uh, bullets here, um, if you have any thoughts or, um, and this is something where you can also send an email to uh, uh, Melissa Lapsa afterwards, but. If we had the time to discuss one or two, um, or if you can share some experience uh, right now, that would be great. Um, um, but um, if if not, we also appreciate if you can share your experience with uh, uh, Melissa Laps and the team later. I'm not seeing any questions typed in or any hands raised. Um, and I know we're running close on time. So Simon, maybe you could share the other uh, yeah, last yeah. set of questions. And, and then um, Melissa, you can show the last side that has your email on it so people know how to get a hold of you. Right, right. OK, so next slide. Um, and if I can have a couple of clicks there too. Right, OK. So. And another question that that are relevant now is, of course, for retrofit commissioning. You know, what is the difference between commissioning for new construction and for retrofits? And um, are incentives different? What's the building owner's incentives uh, incentives for uh, retrofit commissioning? What are the barriers? Are we missing certification programs? Um, and again, then, can new construction metrics apply to retrofits? Uh, those are the questions and, and, uh, that we think are important when di discussing uh, commissioning and retrofit commissioning. Um, so with that, I think we can have click over to our very last slide. Um, so we have a double click. See if we have. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. And uh, back to me, Melissa Lapsa, to, to close out this, uh, this webinar. I really appreciate everyone's participation today. Um, and of course, Simon and Paul for your excellent presentations. Um, we would like to hear from all of you. So these, these tech team meetings are meant to be uh, interactive. So we appreciate your participation. We'd like to, we'll send out the slide deck and a link to the recording. So we'd like to you know, hear from you. You can call me or email me. Um, and uh, give us your comments on Simon's questions. And also, as Simon mentioned, there's a link here to our website. Uh, give us feedback. It's got a lot of information broken down by windows, walls, and roofs, and we're continuing to add resources to the website. Um, and this, these resources are there for the team. So if something's missing or you have questions about it, please let us know. Um, and we'll also be you know, sending out information on what our next tech team meeting will, will be, what the subject will be, um, based on the feedback that we've received on priority topics to cover. Um, so we do have, we, enjoy, we encourage you to join the team. Uh, we do have some 
ongoing activities um, as well that once you're a member of the team, uh, they're open for your engagement. Uh, we have an air tightness uh, requirement study going on right now. We have technology verification studies going on right now. So we would encourage all of you, if you're not already engaged with our team, to join. Uh, you just send me an email and we'll follow up. So uh, with that, I will um, thank any, everyone once again and appreciate your participation. So have a great rest of the afternoon.